passionate educators from all around the country, um, as well as locally. Um, and I work with student programs here occasionally as well. Um, we're really excited to have you here. And I know that I've seen some familiar names in the chat box. So I think we have some of our teacher institute alums mm -hmm. with us today, which is awesome. All right. So uh, just to give you a little bit of context, um, since you are an audience that's coming from all around the country, uh, we wanna just make sure that we tell you a little bit about who we are and where we're coming from. So uh, the Smithsonian American Art Museum and National Portrait Gallery are both part of the larger Smithsonian Institution, which is, uh, some of you may know, the world's largest museum education and research complex. And it actually includes 19 museums, 21 libraries, nine research centers, three cultural centers, and the National Zoo. So it's a massive <laughs> institution for uh, learning and uh, research and education. And you can see um, in the circled uh, box at the bottom there, you can see the facade of our building. Um, we actually house both museums in the, the building you see down there at the bottom. And you'll see on the map that it's actually not located on the National Mall, where many of the other Smithsonian museums you may have visited are located. All right, and then there's our building a little bit larger. Uh, the American Art Museum and Portrait Gallery are both housed in this National Historic Landmark building, which is located in the Penn Quarter neighborhood of DC. It was originally built as the US Patent Office building in the 19th century, where it served as a hub of invention and innovation and was later transferred to the Smithsonian with Sam and NPG opening in 1968 in this building. Um, so I think we were maybe going to do a little poll of the yeah. audience here just to see how many of you have visited the Smithsonian American Art Museum or National Portrait Gallery before in person. Um, so I think we're setting that up here. All right, so we're getting Very a lot nice. of responses in. This is awesome. So about three quarters of you have visited and about 20 a little over 25% have not, so that's awesome. We're, we're even getting so, in the chat box that it's it's uh, Kent's favorite. Yes. <laughs> so we're saying not yet, but that means future visitors. Great news. Right. <laughs> um, so just to tell you a little bit about our individual museums, the Smithsonian American Art Museum is actually the nation's first collection of American art, and it's really dedicated to celebrating the creativity of artists whose works reflect the American experience and global connections. And the museum is home to one of the largest and most inclusive collections of American art in the world. Um, and its artworks reveal um, sort of key aspects of the United States's history and cultural traditions over the last three centuries. Um, and as Phoebe mentioned, um, both museums moved into the building in 1968, um, but the Portrait Gallery was created by an act of Congress in 1962. So we are still uh, a fairly young museum, um, but our mission is to tell the story of this country through the people who have shaped it. Um, and that will include, of course, artists and scientists and politicians, inventors, activists, performers, et cetera. The list goes on and on. Um, our collection is about 25,000 images. Um, and at any given time, we can show about 900 to 1,000. So even though you only get to see a little bit, there is so much more out there, which is one of the reasons why these webinars are so fantastic, because we can introduce you to images that aren't necessarily on view right now. Absolutely. And we're going to show you, um, we've created a learning lab collection to go along with this webinar where you'll be able to access the artworks and some related resources. We've, we'll, we'll share that with you. Exactly. And we'll talk about learning lab a little bit more as well. Um, the Portrait Gallery and the American Art Museum are proud to participate in the Smithsonian American Women's History Initiative because of her story. Um, the initiative was launched in 2018 um, and it really is um, to undertake research, um, to collect, to document, display, and share the compelling story of women. 
Um, it really is um, and has a digital first mission. So there isn't a specific museum that is dedicated to the story of women within this country. But um, the idea behind the American Women's History Initiative is to bring together all of the wonderful resources of all of those museums and research complexes that Phoebe had just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So how all of this connects to what we're doing today is that uh, Sam and NPG collaborated to um, propose this project and we were granted funding through the American Women's History Initiative at the Smithsonian uh, to write and produce a set of six classroom teaching posters that would feature three artworks from each of our collections featuring women's stories. And then to go along with that, we wanted to offer this webinar series. So we, we had a programming component to it. Um, so selecting these six artworks to feature, as you might imagine, was a challenging process, given that <laughs> we have thousands of artworks to choose from, but it was also a really fun process. Um, it was important to us to feature women who come from maybe more underrepresented backgrounds and broaden the scope of beyond women who are already very widely taught in schools and maybe introduce teachers to some women that they were unfamiliar with. Um, we also wanted the artworks to be useful in teaching across the curriculum, not just in art class um, or not just in history class, for instance. So we looked for works that might offer thematic entry points um, across history, language arts, science, um, visual arts. So after narrowing down our choices to maybe our top 12 or 13, we reached out to some teacher colleagues around the country, getting feedback about which ones they would be most interested in having in their classrooms. And we're super excited about the six <laughs> images that we've chosen um, and the potential stories that they can bring into your classroom. So each of these three webinars, this is the first of three, um, will focus on two of these images that you see before you, um, one from Sam and one from MPG. And we'll also be bringing in some additional artworks that aren't featured on the poster sets just to sort of expand our conversation. Um, and best of all, if you registered for this webinar, you're going to receive a full set of these posters in the mail in the coming weeks. They are supposedly arriving to us this week. We have not seen them yet, but they're going to be beautiful and we will have them mailed out by the end of this month. Yes. Um, so as we were thinking about this webinar series, we wanted to um, come up with a number of um, objectives to guide our conversation um, over the three webinars. Um, because we are looking at American art and portraiture, we wanted to think about how you can use both of those um, and bring uh, diverse women's stories into the classroom, but also how you can discover connections between both American art and portraiture and link it to other disciplines, just as Phoebe was talking about. Um, as Anne had mentioned at the beginning, we use um, an inquiry-based approach to all of our programming. Um, so we have also infused these webinars with um, strategies, um, looking strategies, engagement strategies for how you might um, use these particular images and really others as well um, with your students. Uh, and then finally, we'll make sure to save a little bit of time at the end to brainstorm ideas um, that you may have um, to take back into the classroom with you. Um, so with that, each of our, um, each of the webinars that we'll be hosting will have an essential question. And today's essential question is, how have women led the way in activism and social justice movements to, um, to warm up that idea, um, we have two questions for you. So when you think about women leading the way in activism and social justice movements, who comes to mind? And then what movements come to mind? Um, you can go ahead and respond via chat box and we'll summarize um, and we'll work on summarizing the comments um, and we'll respond to those. Um, but I thought that while you are um, responding via the chat box, this might be a good time, Phoebe, to just sort of circle back on Learning Lab um, and yeah. what that actually is. I'm sure that we have participants um, that um, have used Learning Lab, but it is um, 
it's a Smithsonian interactive platform um, whereby you can discover millions of the Smithsonian's objects and resources. You can create content um, with online tools, and then you can share these collections um, that you have created. Um, and so we've loved within our roles at our museums, creating learning lab collections, both for teachers and for students. Um, so we have created a collection in conjunction with this webinar, as well as the next two um, that we'll be hosting. Okay, so <laughs> lots of responses in the chat box, which is great. Those comments are coming in fast and furious, and I love what I'm seeing. I'm seeing everything from Lucretia Mott to Serena Williams, um, and everything in between, and uh, both sort of more historical movements, women's suffrage, and um, sort of 19th century figures up in, until today with Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter, um, LGBTQ rights, uh, several Angela Davises coming through. And I'm also seeing, you know, women who have um, sort of performers as activists as well. So uh, voting rights, civil rights. Um, wow, you guys are, you're hitting so many. <laughs> labor, labor rights, environmentalism. So I love what we're already bringing to the conversation. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Fantastic. And we hope that this webinar might give you some new ideas and ways to expand on this question. Um, so before we look at our first artwork, um, I want to talk a little bit briefly about some of the approaches that we'll be using. And again, you know, we're doing this through a webinar where we have a huge number of participants. So it'll be a little different for you if you're using one of these in the classroom. But um, we're going to be trying a number of approaches that you can use to explore, to explore an artwork with your students. And many of those will be from Harvard's Project Zero. Um, I think Anne's going to do a poll. How many people are familiar at all with Project Zero thinking routines? Just want to get a sense of our group here. Okay. Awesome. So for looks like a little over half the group, they're brand new. Uh, a little over a quarter, they're very familiar. And then about 15%, somewhat familiar. Uh, so that's a really great range. So briefly, uh, Project Zero is actually a series of projects based out of Harvard's Graduate School of Education that seek to better understand thinking and learning. And when it, it was founded by Nelson Goodman back in 1967, the focus was on understanding learning through the arts, which is still a big part of many of its projects today. And a couple of the projects that you may be familiar with if you've heard anything about Project Zero are called Artful Thinking, uh, Making Thinking Visible, um, Visible Thinking. So those are some of the, the project titles. And then a central component that really ties these projects together is the idea of thinking routines. And what a thinking routine is, is basically a short, kind of seemingly simple series of questions that are designed to be easy to remember, but um, elicit particular types of thinking based on the questions that they ask. And the idea is to really make them a routine in your classroom, using them frequently with different types of things from artworks to documents, to uh, maps, to all kinds of things you might use. Um, so that the patterns of thinking and that pattern of questioning becomes a habit of mind for your students that they can use when they're encountering new things in the world. Um, so in just a minute, when we look at our first artwork, we're going to use a, think a thinking routine called See, Think, Wonder to frame our looking. And some of you may be familiar with See, Think, Wonder and others may not be, but the great thing about it is that it's really extremely simple to use, but it can elicit really rich thinking. What we're going to do is start by listing literally what we see in the image. And what I mean by that is really things that you can point to in the artwork. This helps differentiate between observation and interpretation for your students. So for instance, if you see a smile on a person's face, that's something you see. But the idea that that person is happy is something that you're inferring from the smile. So that would be a think rather than a see. Um, and then we'll move on from that to share what we're wondering about the artwork. What does it make us curious about? What do we want to know more about it? 
Um, so if you do have a piece of paper and something to write uh, with handy or nearby, I encourage you to get it out now so that you can fully participate. Um, and even if you're watching this webinar as a recording after the fact, I encourage you to participate as well um, to get the full experience. So I'm going to put up our first artwork here. And let's just start by walking through the first step of the thinking routine, which is again, C. So if you have a piece of paper, and don't, don't worry about putting this in the chat box right now, but for yourself, I'd like you to try to write down maybe five things that you see in this image. So take just a moment there. Try to look at every part of it. You might imagine that your eyes are a scanner going over the whole image and just try to write down at least five things that you see. You might go back and look again if you've already listed four or five and see if you can add any more. See if there's anything else that you notice that you can add to your list of what you see. And in the classroom, I would really give a good amount of time to this and I might document students' responses on the board or um, on a piece of chart paper. Um, for our purposes today, I'm going to have a little bit of a conversation with Brianna here about <laughs> what she sees. And while that's happening, I'm going to encourage you, if you're, if you're ready, to start responding in the chat box with some things that you're thinking and wondering about this artwork. And then Anne can kind of summarize those in a few minutes. So feel free to share what you're thinking and wondering about this artwork in the chat box. So Brianna, what do yes. you see in this artwork? Um, well, at first glance, I see um, what looks like um, a painting of the United States mm -hmm. um, with um, a lot of dripping paint. Um, so it feels a little bit um, messy. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see, or I can see um, the dividing lines um, among the various states, um, as well as a differentiation in color um, by state. Um, you can also see um, some of the uh, Canada, Canadian mm -hmm. um, areas. Um, but what I'm struck by is, um, how some of the states are missing um, names, whereas others have names um, over the top of the state. Okay, awesome. So you've noticed that we have a map of part of North America, the what we recognize as the United States, and then part of Canada and Mexico. You notice that there are several different colors, and that there's sort of this effect of paint dripping down the canvas, and you said that makes you feel like it it's maybe messy. Um, and then you notice that the that some of the states and place names are labeled and some are not. Mm -hmm. Awesome. It's a great start. So Anne, have you noticed uh, any trends in, coming up in the chat box here with thinks and wonders? Yeah. So a lot of folks are wondering why do we see the names of some states and why are others missing? There are also a lot of questions about the colors that are being used. And um, then also some, some sort of wonderings about uh, some of, sometimes the word melting is being used, sometimes blurring or sort of dripping. Um, so those seem to be the sort of the, the things and the wonders that are rising to the top for the group. Okay, great. And again, in the classroom, I would spend probably several more minutes on our things and wonders. Um, for our purposes today, I'm just giving you a little snapshot of what this looks like. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background, maybe answer some of your wonders. Um, you can see the basic label information there. This is a piece called State Names that's in the Smithsonian American Art Museum's collection. And it's made by an artist named Jean Quictacy Smith in the year 2000. And Jean Quictacy Smith is a contemporary artist 
who is an enrolled Salish member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai uh, nations. Um, and this painting, which is oil collage and mixed media on canvas, what Smith has done is she has omitted all the place names that derive from European sources and kept only the names that come from indigenous language. So you can see uh, a lot of the states on the East Coast there that come from European names are missing, um, where there's, whereas there's a lot in sort of the middle part of the country that are names of uh, tribes or come from native words that come from native languages. Um, and then several place names in Canada and Mexico as well. Um, so what she's really doing here is kind of confronting the viewer with this, this contested space where we have uh, the presence of native peoples being forefronted on these lands that were historically, where they were historically removed from. Um, and a lot of you were looking at her stylistic choices, the colors, the effect of the paint dripping down the canvas. Um, and maybe those made you think of tears, maybe they made you think of blood pouring down the canvas. Those are things that come up a lot when we look at this painting with students or adults. Um, but we have this sense of blurred boundaries and maybe violence and sadness and anger. And these are all effects that Smith is creating through her stylistic choices here. And one of the fantastic things um, that we have access to through the Smithsonian American Art Museum is a video interview with the artist. And this is part of a growing series of artist interviews that we are producing and adding regularly to our webpage and our YouTube channel. Um, so I highly recommend utilizing these in the classroom and letting your students hear directly from the artists when possible. So we're going to give you just a little clip here um, where you can hear directly from John Quick to C. Smith. In high school, I decided that I did, yes, want to go to college and take art. At the end of the year, the professor called me into his office and said, you can draw better than the men, but I have to tell you, you need to go into another field. Because he said, you'll never be able to be an artist. Women are not artists. I like to use maps because maps can tell stories. So what I did with this particular map is to erase all European presence. I eliminated every state that has a European name and I kept only the states that have Native American names because the whole place was ours until the invasion came, the great invasion. Part of what I do in my work is using my work as a platform for my beliefs and can I tell a story? Can I make it a good story? Can I add some humor to it? Um, can I get your attention? Those are all things that I try to do with my artwork. Great. So if you had watched the rest of the video, Smith goes on to talk about how she really feels like her work will go on being political. And she, st she states, I passionately believe in the life that I live. And um, she, she goes on to, um, she talks about how her tribe is her biggest influence and she, she as an artist and activist regularly uses her platform and success to lift up other Native artists. And she's curated exhibitions of their work um, and she regularly speaks and advocates for Indigenous rights and representation. Um, so this commitment to lifting up contem contemporary Native Americans in our world today is really important to Smith. And I just want to end on this by raising the idea that while this painting does convey a lot of loss and violence and grief, it's also a testament to the resilience of Native peoples. Um, and Smith, Smith says, we are alive everywhere across this nation. So you can think about um, how this, this painting really helps us see the contemporary presence of Native Americans and uh, making them visible. This is really important in a uh, classroom today where 
the vast majority of mentions of native peoples in textbooks, um, studies have shown are pre-1900. So it's, this is an opportunity to bring in a contemporary native woman's voice. Um, I just wanted to add, Phoebe, I'm seeing in the chat box that people are already thinking about how they're going to use it in the classroom, which is fantastic. And then someone also had a question about um, where this video can be viewed. Uh, we are going to, it is part of the Learning Lab collection that we're going to share with you. We'll put that link in the chat box um, at the end of the session. Uh, but also I'm seeing that our friends have found it already for us and are sharing it in the chat box. So thank you all. Um, there's a question about which tribe uh, Jean Quick to see Smith is from. So she is Salish. Um, mm -hmm. She's a member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. Mm -hmm. and she, I believe she was born in the Flathead. Yes, the Flathead Nation. Yes. Um, Montana. All right. All right. So we're going to um, switch gears a little bit um, and take a look at. Um, a portrait of Dolores Huerta, um, which is in the Portrait Galleries collection. Um, so we've taken a look um, at an artist as activist. So let's take a close look at a portrait of an activist. Um, but before we take a deep dive into um, the close looking of this image, I wanted to bring up this idea of the elements of portrayal. Um, and this is, um, this is really the foundation of how the Portrait Gallery um, looks at images um, when it comes to engaging with students and teachers. So these are the visual clues that are found in portraits um, that you really need to tease out and think about if you want to tell the story of that image. So um, the elements of portrayal, there's 10 of them. I'm just going to quickly list them off, um, but I can also add to our Learning Lab collection our Reading Portraiture Guide for Educators, which will have information about these elements. Um, so when you're considering the likeness of your subject, the person in the portrait, we're always thinking about pose, um, expression. We're thinking about the hairstyle of the individual, the clothing of the individual. We need to think about medium. So what materials were used to create um, this portrait, whether it is oil on canvas and engraving on paper or a photograph, et cetera. Um, the scale, um, and scale means really two different things for us. One is the size of the image itself, but also the size of the subject within the portrait. Uh, the artistic style, um, so thinking about the artist and his or her style, um, which really does go very, um, which is very much aligned with medium. Um, our setting is always important, as are um, any objects that might be represented within a portrait. And then color. Um, and so color, like the color tends to um, set tone and set mood within images. So now that you have those elements, you can consider them your looking toolkit. Um, I want us to take a few minutes and actually jump into this portrait. Um, and you are going to choose a spot within this image that you're gonna jump into. And once you are in your spot, I want you to consider your five senses. Um, so Anne is going to zoom over the image um, slowly, but as you're thinking about where you wanna jump in, you can be as big as you are or as small as you want to be. Um, that's always what I tell students. Um, and you can jump in anywhere. So think about all of those elements. But once you find that spot that you wanna jump into, think about um, what you hear. Think about what you might smell. What do you see? What can you touch? And what texture is it going to be? And then finally, and probably the most difficult one is, what are you gonna taste? So not actually what you're gonna taste, but if you were in this place, you know, what, you know, I guess think about taste as a sense, you know, maybe connected with um, smell. Um, what might it remind you of? Any chance it reminds you of a food, et cetera, et cetera. So for this, you don't need to um, jot down your responses in the chat box. You're just thinking about where you would jump in. Um, but also think about why you chose that particular place. So based on your experience of jumping in, 
what do you think is happening in this portrait? And this you can respond in the chat box. Um, what do you think is happening? If we think about um, those elements, right, we can tell that our subject, in this case, Dolores Huerta, um, is certainly outside. We see a car in the background. Um, we see trees. So where, what do you think might be happening here? Great, we're seeing lots of responses coming in here. Yeah, and I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing things like um, she's leading uh, a protest. Um, she's looking off into the distance, right? She has this sign um, that she's holding on to that we can see that it says strike, even though we can't see um, particularly all of it. Um, we're thinking about farm workers' rights, migrant workers' rights. And when we think about um, when we think about those rights, right? What you know, what are the details within the image that give us that clue? Um, and then we had a really great comment about how within this space, she looks like a lone protester. There isn't anybody necessarily around her. Um, and so we don't have this sense of a larger scale um, protest, but also that it looks like a cold, colorless, cloudy day, um, which I think is interesting. It might be a product of, um, of the fact that we are looking at a black and white photograph, which we will come back to in just a little bit. Um, so this is a 1966 photograph um, that George Ballas um, took. Um, George Ballas is the photographer. Uh, and here he is documenting Dolores Huerta on a picket line during the United Farm Workers Organizing Committee's strike against grape growers in Delano, California, or Delano. This strike um, really was a turning point because it led to an agreement between, between the UFWOC um, and Shenley Industries. And it marked one of the union's first triumphs in a battle with California grape growers that lasted half a decade. So given that little piece of um, context, what might the artist be trying to reveal about Huerta in this particular moment? And you can please respond to this via the chat box. Think about one word that might capture what Ballas is trying to convey. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot of comments coming in. Mm -hmm. um, I see strength and confidence, resilience. A lot of determination. Determination, determination yeah. is a great one. Right, and again, going back to this idea that the way that the artist has portrayed her here, that she's alone, um, that certainly says something. Perseverance is another really wonderful one. I get this sense too when I look at this image that because she has this scarf wrapped around her, um, that it feels like she's been, she's been there for a while. Um, Wonderful. Um, so what, what I'd like to do um, is introduce you to um, Taina Caragal, who is the Portrait Gallery's curator for Latino art and history. Um, about once a year, we host an exhibition that stays up for a year. Um, it is our One Life exhibition. 
Um, and that exhibition is about one subject in our collection told from the perspective of one of our curators or historians. Um, and so a few years back, we hosted um, our One Life Dolores Ware to show, and Taina Caragall was the curator who, um, who curated the exhibition. So we wanted to show you just a very short clip to put, um, I guess to put the biography of Dolores Huerta into context with the image that we were just taking a look at. Dolores Huerta is one of the most important civil rights activists of the United States. She was instrumental in making everyone in the country aware of the dire conditions in which farm workers lived. This was not a reality that everyone was aware of in the 1960s. Dolores co-founded the National Farm Workers Association with Cesar Chavez in 1962. She was picket captain. She was lobbyist at a state and federal level. Parallel strategy to at a state and federal level. She was the first woman to negotiate contracts on behalf of a farm workers union. She was a main strategist of the Grapes Boycott, which was a parallel strategy to the grape strike. Grape pickers decided to walk out of their fields in protest for the subhuman conditions in which they were. They didn't have bathrooms in the field, they didn't have any drinking water, they worked between 10 and, and 16 hours a day under the heat for less than the minimum wage, which was about 1.5 an hour. And in parallel to the grape strike was also grapes boycott, where farm workers were sent across the U.S. to supermarkets where they urged urban consumers who had no idea of the conditions in which the produce they thought was harvested not to consume those goods. At the same time, she was the mother of 11 children. She proposed a new model for being a woman, and especially a Hispanic woman. In Mexican families, women were just at that time, you know, expected to take care of the children, to be at home. She took a very public role as the vice president of the union. She was constantly out there in front of the cameras, marching, and that was completely new while having 11 children. <laughs> um, her, Dolores Huerta's biography is so fascinating to me. Um, and you can see, um, that there were a number of other portraits of Huerta that were in our One Life show. And one of the things that the Portrait Gallery did um, with Google Arts and Culture was to create an online exhibition related to this One Life show. So that will also be included um, in the Learning Lab collection. So if you do decide that you're interested in teaching Huerta in the classroom, or maybe you already do, um, there are a number of really wonderful images um, that you can use to help tell her story. Um, so one of the things that we're, oh, I'm seeing that somebody is asking, um, Stephanie's asking photo. about who took the photo. So George Ballas um, was the photographer who took the photo. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, as you think about how um, biography and uh, the visual connect, how the context of having a little bit more information about where to um, might extend your understanding of the portrait. Um, and for that, I'm going to ask Phoebe um, yeah. what she's thinking. For me, hearing Taina talk about Huerta's biography, um, hearing about her as a mother of 11 children really rounded out this portrait for me and helped me see her sort of in a more fully fleshed out way. Mm -hmm. And really thinking about, you know, I saw her strength as a, as a protester, but um, now I'm thinking about, you know, other aspects of her life and what it, what it took to raise 11 children and right. do all of this and, um, you know, sort of seeing maybe, I'm, I'm thinking about maybe a vulnerable side in addition to the strength that and confidence that we see in this portrait. And I think that really humanizes her. Right, right. Absolutely. And I think it's also really, um, 
it's important to think about too, right, the, um, the, the purpose of photography, um, which makes up the greatest uh, portion of the Portrait Gallery's collection, actually. Um, and so when I look at um, photographs in our collection, I always really do think about purpose, right? In its day, when it was created in 1966, what purpose would it have served in that moment? Um, and when I was doing research for, um, for this particular image for the teaching posters, um, I found out that Ballas, the artist, um, who was a journalist first, um, he was compelled to document these strikes when they began in 1965 um, and did this for a period of time where he photographed strikers, um, he photographed the children who were brought in to be strike breakers, um, and he was photographing the growing protest and rebellion in the vineyards of Central California. And I think what's most amazing is during this time that he was photographing, he created more than 30,000 images of migrant workers and their surroundings, um, publishing many of them in Newsweek and Time um, during this particular era. So as we think about this idea of purpose, um, I actually want to switch us to um, another image um, in the museum's collection um, that was taken just five years later um, of two women, um, of Gloria Steinem and Dorothy Pittman Hughes. Um, and while I don't think we'll go through um, this think, puzzle, explore activity um, as an entire group, I did just want to talk about it a little bit because I see Think, Puzzle, Explore as a natural progression from See, Think, Wonder. Um, and often when I facilitate a Think, Puzzle, Explore activity um, with teachers and with students in the gallery setting, we actually always start with what do you see before what do you think? Um, because as Phoebe had said previously, um, the see and the think really helps us differentiate um, observation versus interpretation or analysis. Um, and so really one of the wonderful things about Think Puzzle Explore is that it lets us dig a little bit deeper into, um, into inquiry. Um, so if you were to facilitate something like this in the classroom, um, you might start off with a question like, what do you think um, you know about this photograph? Um, which leads really nicely into the questions or the puzzles that you may have. Um, and I always like to think of those puzzles as your who, what, when, where, why questions, right? Questions that you might not necessarily be able to answer just from looking, but questions that you know that you want to explore, which is why the next step in that thinking routine is so you've taken a look at this image. What does this topic, what does this artwork make you want to explore? Um, and how then are you going to answer the who, what, when, where, why, and how questions? Um, and it really is, you know, what other historical evidence might help us understand the context um, of the image? But for our purposes, um, when you look at this portrait, if you were to caption it, how would you caption it? So think of it in a newspaper or a magazine, what would be your very quick caption um, that you would give this particular image? Go ahead and jot down your ideas um, in the chat box. Strength in numbers, solidarity, girl power, I love that, Black Lives Matter, Best. I'm definitely seeing a trend with girl power, right? Empowerment. Intersectionality. Excellent. Unite. So, um, I want to bring up um, the actual caption for, um, for this image. So you can see it at the bottom. It says, Body and Soul, Gloria Steinem and her partner, Dorothy Pittman Hughes, demonstrate the style that has thrilled audiences on the Women's Liberation Lecture Circuit. So this image was um, taken by Dan Wynn, um, the photographer. And just as an aside, um, Gloria Steinem was the women's activist who um, 
who basically became a Playboy bunny for a period of three weeks um, in the 1950s and then wrote about her experience. And so Dan Wynn already had um, uh, really an artistic relationship with Gloria Steinem because he was the one that took the photos that illustrated her articles. Um, but this particular image um, really was a way to illustrate an article that was written about Gloria Steinem by Leonard Levitt um, in Esquire magazine in October 1971. And the title of the article was She. Um, and it was a really interesting article. Article We're linking to it in the Learning Lab collection. Um, I would highly recommend it. Um, but for me, I was thinking about this connection or maybe even lack of connection between what we see and the caption. So um, a question to, for you all to think about um, is how does this caption really either affirm your understanding of the image or how does it create dissonance? And I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna pose that out there as a question. We're not gonna take the time to um, answer it in this, mo in this moment. Um, but what I do want you to think about is the use of black and white photography. Mm -hmm. um, so in 1968 and 1971, when both of these portrait gallery images were created, color photography was already widely available. It had become widely available in the early 1960s. So why did both George Vallis and Dan Wynn choose to work in black and white? What mood are they trying to convey? That I would love to hear your responses in the chat box. Um, and while we're waiting for responses, I'm gonna pose the question to Phoebe too. What do you think, um, what do you think that they're trying to do by focusing in on black and white photography when they could have easily created color photographs? Well, for me, I, I think black and white tends to create sort of this timeless effect, this iconic, yeah. iconicness of the photograph that maybe takes it out of time and place a little bit and um, sort of lets us focus on sort of the, the key elements of the image. Um, it creates sort of a stark quality. Um, yeah. I don't know, do you have any other thoughts on that, Brianna? No, I, I agree. I think that there is this idea of, um, of the image being timeless, um, which actually leads us so perfectly into um, the next two images that I just wanted to touch on before I handed it back over to um, Phoebe, which is, um, Steinem and Pittman Hughes, they got back together again in 2013 to recreate their 1971 image. Um, and I was, I was struck by this and it's a new acquisition for the portrait gallery. Um, but when we were, um, when Anne, Phoebe and I were talking about, um, when we were talking about this, this webinar, um, Phoebe and Anne brought up this really wonderful point, right? About um, once an activist, always an activist. Um, and I think that we very clearly see that um, with these two images side by side. Um, so with that, I think we're gonna do a little bit more comparison of two images. So I'm gonna hand it over to Phoebe. Yeah, so we've just looked at a couple of photographs and we're going to come back here for our final image to another uh, type of media that is really prevalent in art related to activism and protest, and that's uh, printmaking and graphic arts. And this, this image also ties us back to um, what we were looking at with Dolores Huerta and the farm workers' rights movement. Um, so just taking a look at this image, I'm sure you already have lots of thoughts <laughs> in your mind and associations that come with it. Um, so I'm just going to have a little bit of a conversation with Brianna, and you can think for yourselves how this relates to what you're thinking about the image. Um, I want to know, Brianna, how this image is connected and or disconnected to things that you recognize or are familiar with. Right. So um, for me, um, the it automatically reminded me of um, the very small raisins boxes, the sun-made raisins. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I remember them. Um, I still 
I still buy them for my daughters. <laughs> um, so it's very much um, an, an image that, um, that I am, that is recognizable um, on a daily basis. Um, and then, oh my gosh, as far as disconnected, I mean, obviously, right, we've got um, the variation on the, the headline, really, that we see on the image, but also um, the, the woman um, in sun-made raisins in the box has been replaced by um, a skeleton um, with still the cap and the clothing. Um, so there is this really ominous feel um, especially when you look at the unnaturally grown, so on and so forth. So it's, uh, right, there are a lot of connections to me personally, right? But yeah. also, um, yes, disconnected. Yeah, and I think that's the brilliant thing about this image, right? That um, the artist whose name is Esther Hernandez has taken this iconic image that most of us grew up, you know, looking at in our lunch boxes mm -hmm. that we associate with childhood, um, with, you know, maybe innocence, happy memories, unless you really didn't like raisins, but um, she's subverted it in this sort of surprising and it's a surprising way that makes you want to look more closely and find out what it's about. So just really briefly, we don't have time to go into it in depth, but um, Esther Hernandez is a Chicana artist from California who was an important part of the Chicano art movement that emerged in the late 1960s. And she was born in California's San Joaquin Valley to a Mexican farm worker family. Um, her grandparents immigrated to California from Mexico during the Great Depression to work on commercial grape farms. Um, and Esther went on to study visual art at UC Berkeley and, you know, became involved with emerging Chicano artists. And she went on to join the Mujeres Muralistas, which is a group of female artists creating murals in San Francisco's Mission District. So she really got involved in this political art making scene um, at the time in California. And she also became involved with the United Farm Workers of America, um, led by Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. So she, um, you know, she's a female artist and activist who's inspired by sort of a slightly earlier generation of female activists with Dolores Huerta. Um, and she described the seeds for this, the idea for this print coming from a visit she made to her mother in her hometown one summer and seeing her boil water and wondering why she was doing that. And her mother showed her a notice saying that the water had been contaminated and was unsafe to drink. And she learned that pesticides that were used on the grape farms surrounding the town had, had um, gotten into the ground and contaminated the water sources. So she wanted to comment on this in her art in some way, and it didn't come to her until about two years later when she was driving on the highway and saw an image of the sun-made raisins. And it sort of clicked for her that that was, that was a way to comment on this issue. Um, so, this is a really fascinating artwork that's part of a much larger tradition of mm -hmm. printmaking, um, especially um, in the Chicano arts movement. And we have some more resources on the Learning Lab that I encourage you to explore. Yeah. Um, and then uh, just show you really briefly, um, we have a new image that was created in 2008 that Esther Hernandez made um, that has just been acquired by the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Um, this one is called Sun Raid. And as you can see, um, this deals with issues of deportation. Um, the skeleton in this one is wearing a bracelet that says ICE, um, referring to Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Um, so again, this idea of an activist is always an activist, right? She's continuing to make work that deals with pressing issues today. Um, so. I think we want to uh, move on here and start wrapping up our conversation. Yes, we have just a few minutes left and we will end on time because we know you have places to, to go. So we're just going to do um, sort of a, a quick kind of uh, wrap up slide and ask you some questions um, to consider in, in uh, conclusion. And then as you're sharing your thoughts in the chat box, we're going to go through some other housekeeping uh, slides um, and then we'll, we'll recap uh, at the very end. Great. So we're curious, um, you might think about this for yourself and answer in the chat box. What new ideas has our discussion of these four images given you about women and activism? 
and what ideas are they giving you about how you might utilize them in your classroom. Um, so feel free to respond to those and we're just going to go through a few last uh, housekeeping issues as Anne mentioned. So again, um, we have a learning lab collection ready right. for you. Yes, um, and Anne is going to put the link to the collection um, into, um, into the chat box. There it is, perfect, thank you. Um, and then um, I think probably the very next thing that comes up is going to be um, the posters themselves. Um, so as we said earlier, we're receiving posters this week. So we are um, trying our very hardest to um, get them out um, in the next week or so, um, which means you will probably all receive them by November 1st. Um, if you don't receive them by that date, um, that's when you should feel free to be in touch with us to check on the status. Um, but we think that it'll probably take a little bit of time for things to um, get out and for us to come together and collate and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And we've got great um, suggested questions that you can use to ask students to engage with these images as well as some um, extension activities and connections so we can build, you can build on our conversation today once you have the posters. Um, and I just wanted to remind you about our two upcoming webinars. Um, Who Tells Your Story? Exploring Women and Identity that will be on Thursday, November 7th. And Remaking the Rules, Exploring Women Who Broke Barriers that'll be on Thursday, December, what, what's the date? Fifth. Fifth, thank you. Um, and just wanted to note that those two webinars are at slightly different times. We wanted to make sure that people joining us from different time zones have equal opportunity to join. Mm -hmm. So our next one will be at five o'clock and then, uh, and that's Eastern time. And the December one will start at six o'clock Eastern time. Um, really quickly, we wanted to mention that Brianna and I both offer summer institutes for teachers. So if you haven't already participated in our institutes, you can, uh, Click those links and Anne will maybe share them in the chat box um, to learn more. We have not yet released the dates, dates and applications right. for 2020, but that information will be coming right. soon in the next couple of months. Few months. All right. There's a question about whether the future ones will be recorded because some days aren't good for photos. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all three of these webinars are being recorded and we plan to make those recordings available. So no worries if you can't join us live. Um, you should be able to access this after the fact. All right. So thank you so much for participating. You can see that our email addresses are linked right there. So if you have any remaining questions for any of the three of us, please feel free to reach out. Um, and we hope to see you next time. Yes. Um, We'll stick around for just a few minutes if there are any pressing questions, but we want to be respectful of your time. So thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that you enjoy the posters and will join us next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. <laughs> I love all the thank yous. Hmm. Um, usually, yeah. I mean, I'll speak on behalf of the there, portrait yeah. gallery, right? Yeah. So um, usually when we acquire a print, we'll see um, on the print what number it is um, in the series. So um, an artist might create, um, you know, 250 prints, let's just say, and so we'll you know, we'll see that ours is like fifth in the series. Um, but as far as the original original, um, I mean, I, I think that those can certainly be acquired too. Um, and then, you know, I think it's probably noted um, in the acquisition process from whatever museum. Right. Lori's asking. Oh, and then we have a question about, um, may we have a copy of your slides? And yes, we are going to put um, there. their slides. Oh, their slides are already in the Learning Lab collection, it sounds like. So you should be able to access them through that link that Anne shared, which she's just posting again. Great question. All right. 
Okay, well, thank you all. That, that is the end. Again, we'll, we'll stick here. We'll, we'll hang out for a few more minutes if more questions come in, but um, I see folks are starting. Is there a Can you repeat the elements of portrayal? Sure. Here, let me type them in the in the box as well. Brianna, to me. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Pose, expression, hairstyle, medium, scale, artistic style, setting, objects, color, and clothing. And is that, yes, that actually is. <laughs> um, yes, that is the Namjoon Paik uh, Electronic Superhighway, which is one of the signature artworks here at SAM. That is, um, fun fact, I am not actually in front of the artwork. I am standing in front of a poster of the artwork, but you would never know. All right. Last question. All right, I think we're gonna log off. Um, and thanks again for joining us today. Thanks everyone. Thank you.